good morning everybody uh, and as Heather said uh, welcome to our understanding the COVID-19 public inquiry um, aimed at the social care sector. For those of you who don't know me my name is Philippa Doyle I'm the head of the social care team here at Hemsons. Uh, my role today is going to be very peripheral because we've got two eminent experts with us. Um, we've got our own Liz Hackett, um, partner who works closely with me, who is a um, an expert in inquests and in inquiries. Um, she's been doing these sessions um, around the COVID-19 uh, public, public inquiry um, for a lot of our NHS clients over the last few months. Um, and obviously we appreciate that um, you guys working in the social care sector are just as important. And so we've tailored that this session today to be aimed at um, at yourselves and the things that you need to take away from this and that you may need to do um, uh, if uh, if you get called to be involved in this inquiry. Um, we're also delighted to have with us as our chair today, uh, Professor Martin Green, who I, I hope most of you are know uh, either personally or have come into contact with before the uh, the chief exec of care england um, so i'm going to hand over to to martin now and let him introduce himself and share and then he'll introduce you to liz who will uh, who'll get started so lots of introductions today but um, i hope you find the session worthwhile as heather said um, any questions do pop them in the chat or um, let us know um, and we'll try and pick those up at the end so otherwise thank you very much and enjoy Thank you very much, Philippa, and good morning, everybody. As Philippa said, I'm Martin Green. I'm the Chief Executive of Care England. I also chair the Care Provider Alliance, and I'm really pleased to be chairing this event this morning. Um, I think that there is going to be a lot of focus on the public inquiry, and I hope that today's session will give us a real understanding of the purpose of public inquiries, how they work, and how we as care providers should prepare ourselves to be able to inform the public inquiry for uh, uh, what its recommendations will be. Uh, it's certainly my hope that the public inquiry will be about forensically examining what happened, identifying areas where we need to make improvements, also identifying areas where things worked well, so that we'll be in a better position to understand how to confront a situation like this if we ever have it in the future. I think also we need to really be clear as social care providers that there will be a lot of noise and heat around this public inquiry and we've got to make sure that the social care sector is well prepared and is able to put forward a very coherent approach and some clear messages that will inform the outcome of the inquiry. Um, as Philippa said, we're really lucky to have uh, Liz here today, Liz Hackett from Hempson's, who is extremely experienced in the issue of public inquiries. And Hempson has done work with other uh, providers, both in care and health. So they have a really good understanding of the logistics of the inquiry, how it will work, and also how care providers can position themselves to make the most of this particular inquiry. Um, it's also important that this is a very interactive seminar, so um, as was said at the start, please make sure that you put any questions into the chat box so that we can then make sure that we have a very clear discussion and that any issues or questions that you might have are able to be uh, fielded by the team so that we're all much clearer about how we move forward. So I think that's all I want to say by way of introduction, and I'm really looking forward to what Liz Hackett has to say about the inquiry. So, Liz, I'll hand over to you. Uh, thanks, Martin. Um, morning, everybody. Um, lovely to see so many of you, um, even though it is virtual uh, today. Um, no more introductions. Let's crack on with this session, taking a, an, an overview on looking at the COVID-19 public inquiry and what's potentially going to lie ahead for health and social care uh, providers. Um, this morning, we're going to take a, a look at what we know so far. Um, I'm going to take you through uh, what a public inquiry is and what the, the role may be for health and social care providers. And then we're going to take a look at some practical steps and some uh, planning considerations. In terms of what we know so far, um, well, you'll all be aware that on 12th of May uh, last year, the Prime Minister announced that there was going to be a public inquiry. Um, he announced that it was going to be a full statutory uh, public inquiry. And what that means is that it will attract formal powers under the Inquiries Act. 
Um, and that's important and it's something that I will come back to when we look at what a public inquiry is and how it works um, because it carries skill, it carries some certain rules in its own regard and some certain formalities. Today I'm, um, I'm going to look um, solely um, at the whole of the UK inquiry um, but you will be aware I'm sure that um, some of the devolved governments have announced their own inquiries um, and I'm sure you'll be aware and not surprised to hear that Scotland have stolen the march again and are making greater progress um, than, than anyone else. But what we've been told is that there will be a, um, an, an inquiry um, and there will be answers within a reasonable time frame. And it's been confirmed by the Prime Minister that he is fully committed to learning the lessons at every stage of the pandemic and also the state's actions um, are going to be looked at under the microscope. Um, but the Prime Minister also reiterated what we know about public inquiries, and that's that the primary purpose is to pre prevent recurrence uh, of, of incidents where possible, and at very least to learn lessons for the future. And just before Christmas, it, it was announced that Baroness uh, Heather Hallett was going to be the, the chair of the public inquiry. And that appointment has been viewed very positively um, across government, across the health and social care sector, um, and also importantly, um, by those uh, groups who are working with um, those affected by the COVID inquiry, such as the COVID-19 Justice for Bereaved Families uh, group. And just by way of a little bit of background, so you get a feel for who um, Baroness Hallett was, um, she was called to the bar um, in the early 1970s, and she, she specialised in, in criminal law, uh, becoming a Queen's Counsel. And she was also the first woman who was appointed to the Bar Council in the late 1980s, um, and was appointed to a judicial post in the late 1980s too. Um, and importantly, she was appointed as a Court of Appeal judge in 2005. Um, you may have come across her name before because she was a uh, coroner to the inquests of the 7 July terror attacks in, in London's transport network and she's also chaired some, some other public inquiries. Now the Prime Minister told us um, that uh, the inquiry was going to start in spring 2022. Um, and I don't think it'll come as any great surprise, however, um, for you to hear me say that I think it's unlikely that we will be starting hearings of the public inquiry in spring 2022, which is what people may have anticipated if they were not familiar with the, the public inquiry uh, process. Where we've got to is that we are readily awaiting terms of reference, um, and actually we're told to expect them any day now. Um, and these are the issues that the, the inquiry will explore. Um, and it's important to note um, that, that a statutory public inquiry cannot go beyond the terms of reference. So they're only allowed to look at those matters that are contained within there. So the scope is limited by those terms of reference. So hence why we're all waiting with, uh, with bated breath to see what those terms of reference uh, will include. And I've set out a number of matters on this slide here, um, a number of matters which commentators think are likely to fall within the scope, within the terms of reference. Um, needless to say, however, that you may have uh, thoughts yourself as to, to matters that are, I've not covered in that list, um, and there may be matters that are on that list that, that are not ultimately covered. But in terms of the, the, the health and social care sector, then I think it's quite probable that we will look at matters of um, PPE in terms of the procurement, the supply and the effectiveness in health and social care settings. I think we're going to be looking at some key clinical decisions about the timing of those decisions as well. And that is going to include quite probably uh, the decisions around discharge from hospital to care homes. Um, and there's also going to be an exploration, no doubt, of health outcomes, um, including mortality rates and, and some of the high numbers of, of deaths that I know you will have all faced um, across your, across your um, practice areas. Um, but as I said, um, we are waiting. Um, and um, what we do know is that as early as July, I, I believe, July 2021, 
uh, the COVID-19 Bereaved Families for Justice group had set out what they wanted to be included within the uh, terms of reference. And um, that was uh, very much focused on uh, half a dozen or so key points. Um, summarised as the sufficiency of medical personnel, facilities and equipment, the shortage of PPE, test and tracing system and government strategy to advise to the public. Um, they specifically would like to be covered, the approach in care homes. Um, they also want covering the timing of lockdowns and uh, approaches to travel. Um, the impact that COVID-19 has had on ethnic minority communities and then um, the spread of COVID within uh, certain uh, areas of detention, such as hospitals, prisons um, and so forth. But again, um, going back to Scotland, um, it's, it's quite interesting to see what their terms of reference say, because, of course, they have already been announced. Um, and you'll find them on the Scottish Government website, but I thought it was probably worth just highlighting those that have been set in Scotland in terms of health and social care. Um, there is a specific term of reference which relates to care and nursing homes. And uh, what is going to be examined in Scotland is the transfer of residents to and from care homes and nursing homes, treatment and care of residents, restrictions on visiting, infection prevention and control, and inspections. And then in terms of uh, the further healthcare related issues, um, th there's going to be a consideration of the provision of healthcare services, including the management and support of staff, and then also the delivery of end of life care and decisions around uh, do not resuscitate uh, decisions. So with, with that in mind, what is a, uh, a public inquiry? Um, some of you may be familiar with public inquiries. For some of you, this may be your first potential involvement in, in, in a public inquiry. And they can take many different forms. But as I said at the outset, um, it's significant that the Prime Minister announced that this was going to be a statutory public inquiry held under the Inquiries Act, because it's that statutory footing um, that allows for the specific framing of the terms of reference and the limitations to which, therefore, the inquiry can examine. It also importantly means that there are going to be legal powers regarding disclosure. Then there, there can be disclosure orders made against any individual or organisation to disclose relevant documentation to the inquiry. There's going to be uh, legal powers to compel witnesses to give evidence, whether that be to attend an interview and be inter interviewed on oath or to provide a statement or to attend the ultimate public inquiry hearings and give live evidence. And it also means that there are limitations on the government's control of the inquiry. Um, there are going to be very limited circumstances in which the government can withhold evidence and can withhold from reporting uh, that evidence in the final inquiry report. So I've set out on this uh, slide here, uh, section 1A, and the circumstances uh, where an inquiry is convened. So that's section 1A of the Inquiries Act. And as you can see, central uh, to a statutory inquiry is addressing matters of public concern. And I think it's really important for me to emphasise um, from the outset that public inquiries are inquisitorial. And statutory public inquiries, like, like any other inquiry, are strictly prohibited from making any determination of civil liability or criminal liability. So they are not in any way about apportioning or attributing fault or blame. And for that reason, we have what are known as core participants to the inquiry rather than parties. And core participants are organisations um, or in some cases individuals who have a particular interest in the outcome of the inquiry or in some way may be asked to participate in a significant way 
or perhaps there may be adverse findings of fact. Because while I say there are no, uh, there's no scope for a public inquiry to make any determination of civil liability or criminal liability, in finding facts, those factual determinations may by their very nature contain an element of criticism. And as I mentioned, uh, key, uh, a key factor in a statutory uh, public inquiry um, is the, the legal powers uh, that the inquiry itself will have. Um, and the chair will therefore have, as I said, the power to compel the production of documentation and to compel witnesses to give evidence um, through interview statement or evidence. And it's really important to think of documentation, and we'll look at this again later, as being very wide. Um, it could be anything from a, a policy document to a personal record, uh, right through to a text message or a WhatsApp uh, message. Um, and there are um, penalties that can be imposed within the context of a statutory public inquiry. Um, if there is intentional suppressing or concealing of a relevant document, um, then this is an offence and it can result in imprisonment or a fine. Um, and it's also worth remembering that any registered healthcare professionals will have a professional obligation to assist the inquiry uh, in addition to those, um, those inquiry rules also. Um, and as I've mentioned, um, important to note as we go through um, the next few weeks, looking at what those terms of reference ultimately uh, ultimately include that an inquiry cannot act outside of the terms of reference. So, of course, we are very much waiting with um, with bated breath. Um, following disclosure of documentation, and this is done by the inquiry sending uh, notices to to individuals or organisations who they think may hold relevant documentation. And it's probably worth noting that relevant doesn't have a um, a definition relevant um we just apply common sense to do we think the inquiry would like to see it is the question that uh, i think we should all uh, be asking yourself so the the inquiry will send out notices um seeking uh, disclosure of documentation um that disclosure of documentation may be sufficient to the inquiry um but there will be some organizations from whom the inquiry may seek key witnesses they may seek to interview those witnesses and those witness those witness interviews will take place on oath. Um, they may seek uh, uh, witness statements from individuals, um, and ultimately there will be uh, a long period of public hearings, um, whereby each of the terms of reference uh, will be explored in some detail, and some witnesses will be asked to attend to give additional evidence in that regard. And the very purpose of uh, the, the process of the public inquiry, the gathering of the documentation, the gathering of the evidence through statements and through interviews, and ultimately the public hearing, is um, to determine the facts. What happened? Um, and again, a reminder there that those, those factual findings may be critical but they are not uh, intended to be uh, based on fault or blame. Um, they are intended to be a clear set of found facts. But importantly, and I, I think, uh, you know, building upon those factual determinations, something that sits at the very heart of a, a, a public inquiry um, is the learning element. Um, and Every, every public inquiry um, will, will consider where, whether there are recommendations that need to be made. Um, and those recommendations are to improve services, improve systems, um, and hopefully um, to take away the key learning uh, from the inquiry to assist in any future uh, set of circumstances where the, the similar issues may arise. And of course, the report may also comment on other matters relevant to the terms of reference, perhaps acknowledging changes that you've already made across the, the um, social care sector um, that, that um, therefore don't require further recommendations um, to be made in, in that regard. And looking at what the, what the heart of a, a public inquiry is, what the purpose is, 
as public inquiries are convened to deal with issues of public concern, it follows that they play a pivotal role in public accountability. Um, whether a public inquiry is convened to examine the foot and mouth um, outbreak, um, the war in Iraq, a terrorist incident, um, care uh, provided at a particular hospital or by a particular clinicians, the purpose remains the same. And that purpose, as I've said, is to find out what happened and why it happened, but to learn lessons also to hopefully avoid that recurrence of the event. As such, we all need to be very mindful of the fact that uh, public inquiries have an essential role in identifying procedural and systemic uh, weaknesses and bringing about changes with the aim of protecting the public from uh, further harm and also, um, importantly, um, restoring public confidence if, if public confidence has been uh, lost. Some of you who are familiar with public inquiries may say, do they always achieve that outcome? Arguably not. Um, but what we can say is that we have seen some examples of public inquiries bringing about sustainable change. If we look at the Shipman inquiry, uh, for example, in 2003, Dame Janet Smith published the third of her reports in the Shipman inquiry in which she concluded that the cremation system in place at the time was almost certainly dependent upon the integrity and competence of medical professionals and it failed to protect the public from harm. So she made a number of recommendations um, to overhaul the death certification system and those changes that she implemented are the processes and the procedures that are still in place to this day. So within that slide there, I have set out what the central aims of the, the inquiry are by way of a summary. The preventing recurrence, the establishing of the facts, what happened to determine why it happened. And again, it's very difficult to, 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 to really separate that from a feeling of blame, even if the intention isn't uh, one of blame and to learn lessons for the future. Um, so. There is no power, as I've said, to hold individual or organisations to account for their acts or omissions. But as, I, as I've said, and it, it would be wrong to overlook, that findings can, of course, be used to inform other proceedings if, if, if they are made out uh, within the inquiry. Um, and whilst not, of course, binding, um, those findings are extremely difficult um, to rebut, particularly in a civil context where we are talking about something being more likely than not to have happened. So in terms of how a public inquiry works, for those of you who have not been involved uh, before, I've set the process out on, on the slide there and I'm not going to go through this in, in, in a significant amount of detail, but I, I will just talk you through um, this process. Um, we all know um, that public inquiries are well known for being slow moving. Um, they take on average around four years uh, to conclude. So don't expect, even with the promise of a spring 2022 um, start date, um, that we are going to be wrapping up this uh, public inquiry um, anytime soon. However, some may say that we may see um, shortened terms of reference um, to, to, to do that. Um, however, do we really think the government are going to want uh, to, uh, to be facing any, any greater criticism um, in the coming months as a consequence of a COVID-19 inquiry report? However, politics to one side, this is the process that we follow. The chair's appointed and we've ticked that off with Baroness Hallett's uh, appointment. We're now waiting for the terms of reference, as I've said. Um, so any day soon, we will see terms of reference. In terms of those, uh, the terms, there is no statutory requirement for the Prime Minister and Baroness Hallett to, um, to go out and uh, seek uh, consultation, um, but it has been promised that that will happen. So we will see a draft set of terms of reference and people will be invited to provide a 
uh, any observations that they may have on those. Um, however, I am very sure that there has been a lot of discussions already going on behind the scenes um, by a number of agencies and a number of organisations to try and influence the first draft of those terms of reference. Because experience tells us that when we see that first draft, they are not going to get any narrower. They will get wider, if anything. Um, once we have the, the terms of reference, um, then Baroness Hallett will set a time frame, and that will be a, a time frame in which she anticipates the collation of information, um, the subsequent um, providing of interviews and uh, witness statements, and when she anticipates the oral hearings to be uh, taking place. Um, she will then identify who she thinks are going to be core participants. And she will write letters to them and invite them to accept core participant status. And by being a core participant, what it actually means in practice is you, you get disclosure of the documentation. You get an opportunity to be consulted in terms of the collation of uh, documentation and the investigations being undertaken. And you get an opportunity to express a view in terms of the shaping of questions that are ultimately put to witnesses. In order to be a core participant, as I said, you have to have an interest you, in, the, uh, in the inquiry subject. You have to have a significant uh, interest in that. I think it's probably fair to say because every person in the country could otherwise uh, seek uh, core participant status. And, and realistically, um, it's going to be those who face um, either criticism as a result of potential adverse findings of fact, and I use criticism with a, a small c, so given what I've said about it not being a, a fault-based uh, system, or where there is going to be some significant uh, areas of learning. Um, I don't anticipate that, uh, that all NHS trusts and all care providers will be uh, offered core participant status, or if they were to apply, would be granted core participant status. But we will have a better idea as to what the impact is going to be and the likely need for core participant status across the health and social care sector when we see the terms of reference. Those requests for information will go out to people. So where, um, where the uh, inquiry team consider that an organisation or an individual may hold information that will help to address those terms of reference, um, there will be a notice sent requesting information. Um, the inquiry team will also support a uh, will also appoint a panel of experts and policy professional professionals. I am sure. And then ultimately, we will have public hearings. And if there are, for example, six terms of reference, then I would imagine we would have six chapters to the public inquiry and each of those chapters will address a different term of reference and we will have separate hearings taking place in relation to each of those chapters. Because it's a statutory public inquiry, it has to be heard in public. Um, and what we see now is that most of our uh, public inquiries um, are live streamed um, on the internet um, so that anybody can attend. We, if you are a core participant, and only if you are a core participant, um, will you see a draft copy of the report? And it goes through maximalization, which means that you can correct the errors in the report. You can't change the conclusions, but you can correct any errors. And then the report will be published and recommendations will be contained within that report. And it will be um, for um, if there are recommendations in relation to the health and social care sectors, it will be it will be for those sectors um, to pick up those recommendations and to take steps in that regard. So what's going to be the impact on, on health and social care providers? Well, this, this very much depends on the terms of reference, I'm afraid. I hope to be in a position to be able to tell you a little bit more by today, but until we see those, then it's going to be very difficult for, for us to draw a, a firm conclusion. But most certainly watch this space, and I'm sure Philippa will put out an alert to social care 
uh, providers once we, we see those draft terms of reference. Um, but you may well be asked um, as providers to provide disclosure. And in due course, you may be asked um, to give evidence. You may be asked to identify uh, key individuals who were involved in matters relevant to the specific terms of reference to undertake an interview, whether that be uh, a face to face interview, but it, it, in many times now a question and answer uh, interview where, whereby you sign a statement of truth in the way, same way as you would if it were, were taken on, on oath. Um, as I say, I, I doubt that there will be a, a role for all providers in terms of core participant uh, status. But again, when we see the terms of reference, I'm sure it's something that we're going to be considering across our, the health and social care sector as to who requires, um, who is likely to be granted uh, core participant status and having those conversations with, 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 with those providers um, in relation to that. And the other way that you may be impacted is through the conclusions and the recommendations that the report uh, makes um, and um, in relation to uh, any changes that perhaps uh, may be recommended. Um, and the question therefore arises as to whether those recommendations may shape the future of health and social uh, care. Um, and I'm sure there'll be a range of views um, as to whether that is likely to, to happen. Um, there may well, however, be some extensive uh, impact upon your administrative functions if you are one of those organisations who is asked to provide disclosure or statements. Um, please don't underestimate um, that the participating in a public inquiry, even if you're not a core participant, but you're just the provider of documentation and information, can actually be quite a, a significant and burdensome task that requires a lot of planning and preparation and you need to ensure that the, the relevant resource is allocated um, if you are invited to provide disclosure uh, to, uh, the, uh, to the inquiry. Um, and perhaps you may need to provide some support uh, to your staff. Um, a room, uh, you know, this has been a, a difficult couple of years um, and you may be asking them to, to go a step further in terms of participating uh, in the inquiry. And a reminder too, and I take this opportunity whenever I can, um, of the importance of the duty of candour. As I'm sure you all know, there's a duty on all organisations who are registered with the uh, CQC um, and all registered professionals to be open and honest. And uh, duty of candour always comes under the spotlight in public inquiries, quite often attracting um, as much criticism for the lack of candour as for the underlying acts or omissions that may have occurred in terms of the fact finding. And I set out in this slide here for, for your own reading um, a few of the recent inquiries where core participants have failed to demonstrate uh, sufficient candour. Um, and of course, these slides will be circulated, um, so um, I, I shan't go through um, those uh, today. Um, but let's move on and take a look at some, some practical steps and some planning. Um, early planning is really important for anybody, any organisation who thinks they may find themselves involved in the, the inquiry. Being caught on the back foot when faced with a request from the inquiry team to provide disclosure or evidence by way of statements can not only complicate the process, but can put an unnecessary stress on you and your staff. And it can also hinder the accuracy of any response and the conclusions, therefore, that an inquiry may ultimately reach. And it also may put your organisation and your witnesses at risk of criticism if they don't have the accurate and full information to hand um, during any evidence that they may give. Um, stop notices. Um, this may be something new on all of you, um, or some of you may have um, read alerts that were given by NHS England. Um, uh, the, uh, I think in June of, of, of last year, all a stop notice is is a notice to to your staff, um, telling them in very simple terms what a public inquiry is and what those duties or are, are that they have to a public inquiry, 
and telling them not to destroy anything that might be a relevant document for the public inquiry so that you are preserving all data um, and all information if it's requested in due course. But a reminder there that it's information that is wide reaching and as I've said it may include WhatsApp messages, text messages and it may include information held on personal devices. Um, so an important consideration. Allocate appropriate resource and uh, of course this will be dependent um, on what the terms of reference actually are when we see them and what your role is likely to be in the inquiry. Um, but don't underestimate the, that a public inquiry can be demanding in terms of both time and resource. Um, consider appointing an inquiry lead. That's the person within your organisation who, who may coordinate the response. Uh, or any communication with the public inquiry uh, team and identify any key decision makers within your organisation. Um, and some important considerations that if, if those key decision makers during the course of the last two years have moved on, have you got their up to date contact details? Equally, if people are going to be moving on, make sure you collate their up to date contact details so that if you're asked by the inquiry to make contact, you're able to do so. Um, a few practical hints around IT. It's it's not my bag, IT, so don't worry, I'm not going to talk for long on it. Um, but don't but just um bear in mind that if you go through the process of collating your documentation, um, make sure it's not going to be uh, lost because you have a systems upgrade or you have a migration of data as a consequence of a, a, an upgrade or you have specific retention rules and that includes to any documentation that might be on your, your system now. So it falls part of the, the stop notice effectively um, that not only do we need to be preserving the documentation but we need to make sure that it's not going to be uh, lost in due course. Um, informing and keeping your staff informed. If, you, if you're a, a large organisation um, and staff are, are starting to be asked to provide this disclosure and this information, then do be very mindful of the impact that it might have on them. Um, and if there's any support that, that you might be able to give them, even if it's just informing them what a, a public inquiry is all about so that they, they feel less daunted. Um, and of course, you're going to need to consider what you what your role is going to be in the inquiry. I'm sure there'll be many of you who are thinking, Actually, um, I think I've got a lot to say and um, if we're given an opportunity, I'd like to participate in, in, in the inquiry. And I'm sure there's a lot of you who are sitting there thinking I'd like to keep my head down and to, for this one to, to very much pass me uh, by. Um, and if you are going to start um, putting, uh, start that process of pulling together relevant documentation either now or when the terms of reference um, are known, um, and you're going to store it in a set, in a central place for onward disclosure to the inquiry then some practical tips about how you're going to do that um, you need to identify the documentation in a structured way um, and that might be by identifying it by reference to generic themes or specific issues so for example um, if PPE falls part of the terms of reference um, then you might want to collate all documentation into one into one file um, relevant to PPE. Um, if staffing issues are going to be another, then you, you may wish to um, collate a separate folder of, of staffing issues. Alternatively, you may wish to just do it by a, a timeline. What decisions your organisation made, made when, uh, by reference to key dates nationally and locally. Um, but it, it, it's really important if you've got a lot of documentation to make sure that it is indexed um, by, by some sort of theme um, or by uh, some sort of generic topic or specific topic, depending upon what the terms of, of reference say, to make it easier for onward disclosure. And if you're asked to provide evidence so you know which cohort of that documentation you are going to go and, and reference. Um, make sure that you know when your system upgrades are going to happen, migration of data is going to happen. Don't do all the hard work just to then lose it um, and be clear of what your governance structures are about making onward disclosure if that's requested of you in due course. So finally and in summary, um, just a few bullet points there about uh, some of the, the practical steps. Be clear what your objectives are what your strategy is, i.e. What, what you want to achieve, if anything, from the public inquiry. Think about the support that you need 
but very much um, it's about being prepared. Um, and that concludes the formal part of the presentation. Um, so I'm going to hand back to Martin in his um, capacity as uh, chair for today. Thank you so much, Liz. Thank you for that very comprehensive and extremely clear outline of the public inquiry and also for putting in place some things that we may have to consider uh, in relation to how we intervene with the inquiry. Um, John Cowman put, put in a question in the in the chat about the, all this administration. To what extent is there money available or resources available to help with that? Or is that something that organisations just have to bear in their own resources? Um, yes, I mean, the, the nature and extent of any involvement for, for anybody across the, the social care sector um, will be a cost that will have to be borne um, themselves, I'm afraid. Um, and that is something that people will be very mindful of. Um, can I ask a question, Liz, about um, a bit about the terms of reference, I guess, um, because there are some groups that were very badly um, informed at the start of the pandemic. So I'm thinking about people who support people with learning disabilities, for example. I know home care felt very neglected from, for example, policy and guidance. Um, and to what extent, it, it, if the inquiry terms of reference don't include that, is there any wriggle room for those providers to talk about their experiences and to make sure the inquiry takes account of that? Yeah, and I'm sure they will be looking um, probably towards organisations such as yourself um, when we see the draft terms of reference to perhaps go back to uh, the, the inquiry um, and, and point out the, the omissions. Um, I anticipate that there will be um, a generic um, policy consideration um, and guidance consideration theme, um, but they will be very much um, what policies and guidance uh, were given by, by government. And it's um, whether they will go far enough into the health and social care uh, setting to, to ensure that the um, that we are not having lost communities with, within uh, within the inquiry um, that there have, of course has been a lot of talk about the impact on um, certain uh, ethnic minority groups of, of COVID-19 um, and there has been talk about the impact in care homes and there has been talk about um, the impact upon mental health but uh, you're quite right there has not been a, a big narrative um, around certain uh, certain sections of our of our community who who may carry their own vulnerabilities in terms of um, those learning disability uh, patients who may live semi independently um, and not fall within care and nursing home settings. Um, so this is, I think, um, why um, Baroness Hallett has been very clear in that it is her intention, even though she is not required to do so, to make sure that those terms of reference do go out for consultation to give organisations the opportunity to say, well, actually, that term of reference may be OK, but is it going to cover you know, this cohort of individual who falls within the health and social care setting? Um, it's much wider than just a care home, nursing home uh, question. Thanks. Uh, Tom Griffiths has made the point, is it possible for members of the public to just contact the inquiry or indeed to submit evidence? Yes, and there will be a, there will be a process laid down um, for for people to be able to 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 do that. Also, I wanted to ask what will be the role of the regulator in this inquiry? Will they be a core participant or will they just be required to submit evidence? Or how do you think the regulator will engage with this inquiry? Who knows is the, um, the, 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 the answer to, to that question. I'm sure you know your social care regulators um, far, far better than I do. Um, I have no doubt that they will be offered core participant status, not least because of the learning outcome, um, that um, if there are recommendations made in relation to changes to health and social care moving forward, then regulators um, need to be uh, part of the process to reaching um, the, the, the conclusions that feed into those.
um, those recommendations. Um, you may know better um, than me in terms of what your feeling is um, about your own uh, about regulators within health and social care. Yeah, I think we we probably on this call all have our various views on regulators, uh, and I guess it will be dependent on where they're positioned in the inquiry. Uh, John Cowman also makes a point uh, when he talks about the broad omission of supported living in the development of, of policy during the pandemic compared to registered care services. And uh, I guess uh, John's point is how broad do you think they will go in relation to trying to establish how the whole system worked, including things like supported living? Yeah, I, I mean, we're, we're talking about um, so very much when we, we see those draft terms of reference, perhaps um, from Scotland. Um, and I, I don't think they are being consulted up, upon. I think they are the final the final terms of reference. We very much see, um, as, as I said before, um, care and nursing homes and not that wider health and social care setting. Um, and I think um, for, for those of you who are concerned, you need to be looking out for the draft terms of reference because those draft terms of reference will tell you how to be able to respond to them if you think that there are certain issues that are relevant to the COVID-19 inquiry that have not been captured by the terms of reference. And you will be able to make your own um, submissions either as individuals or as providers to them. Um, that's the usual process, and I don't see any reason why um, Baroness Hallett won't follow that process in that the draft will come out and there will be an opportunity to respond. There is a risk that she will just um, go out to consultation with core groups, um, but if she goes out to consultation with core groups, um, then one would hope um, that they are sufficiently wide to cover Care England. Um, so it might be something that can be picked up at um, at, at, at your level. Um, but um, yeah, there will be an opportunity if you do not think the terms of reference go far enough to see what to see whether there is a way that they can be shaped, influenced further as part of the promised consultation. Um, so let's hope that that consultation is wide reaching. Uh, the other thing, um, Liz, that I wanted to also unpick with you is that many care providers are providing care across the United Kingdom. And now we're in a situation that we may find the public inquiry in Scotland, the public inquiry in, in uh, England and, of course, perhaps in Wales. So how do we manage the process or do we have to see them completely separately? I'm afraid so. Um, I'm afraid they are separate um, inquiries. Um, now, what I don't know is what the legal framework in Scotland is in terms of providers whose registered office is outside of Scotland. Um, however, I would think that as your health and social care providers, you will want to comply with your duty of candour, whether you are in Scotland, Wales, England or Northern Ireland. Um, so, yeah, um, I, look, I, I think the terms of reference that we are going to see by way of first draft from um, Baroness Hallett are not going to be dissimilar to the Scottish terms of reference. So whilst you may have to provide a response in both Scotland um, and in, in the UK as a whole, um, one would hope that your response is going to be broadly a, re a repetition of, of the same task. Yeah, because I think it does uh, go back to the heart of what John said about were resources available, because you may find yourself having to spend a lot of money uh, servicing, in effect, three public inquiries, or indeed, if you're working in Northern Ireland, I don't know if there's any uh, prospect that there may be an inquiry there as well. Uh, you're then going to be in a very difficult position in terms of the amount of administration you deliver in order to be part of this inquiry and making sure that your voice is heard. Yeah, and, and, and public inquiries do have money available that, to them to, to, to fund um, support for certain core participants, but it's such a limited scope that um, I would be lying to you if, if, I, if I said that across, across the sector, um, if you're asked to provide information, you're going to be funded. You're not going to be funded, I'm afraid. Um, there are rules about um, proportionate and reasonable responses. So, um, you know, that has to be borne in mind. How big is your organisation and how 
um, proportionate is and reasonable is the request that is being made of you. I think what's come out of this seminar is the importance of preparing as much as possible before you get into the process of having to deliver things to the inquiry. And the more we have a robust approach to formulating how we're going to put our evidence together, the better and the easier that will be. Yeah, very much. And, and I don't want this to come back and, um, and bite me, um, but I really don't think that there is any um, public or political desire to put any um, significant or undue pressure on um, health and social care providers in what are already challenging times um, to um, take on a burdensome task of providing disclosure and information to the inquiry. Um, I think there will be an attempt to streamline where requests go, um, perhaps through um, bodies who may be able to filter down those requests to individual providers, um, or there may be um, a more high level strategic analysis um, and a it may be that there are um, requests put out for um, some examples from across the uh, the UK to be shared um, and people invited to share stories. I was having a very similar conversation to some NHS colleagues yesterday um, uh, and certainly my feeling was that they will um, in relation to a um, one of the uh, terms of reference, the themes, um, they will perhaps choose a couple of uh, acute teaching hospitals who have different stories uh, relating to a particular theme. They may then choose a uh, perhaps a, a rural community hospital to share a story. They may uh, choose to ask a, a couple of mental health providers and an ambulance trust to share a story. It would seem well, I mean, simply, if, if they came to every health and social care provider in the UK and asked for full disclosure, um, Baroness Hallett will not conclude this public inquiry. Yes, yeah, so it's about manageability, I guess, as, as much as other things. Uh, Verity's put it in the chat. Um, we need to brief our marketing teams, too, so they can support care homes we're likely to receive an influx of press, press inquiries. I think that's a really good point, Verity. And I guess um, there will be implications of this inquiry which need to be managed in terms of the public persona. Yeah, um, so I, as, as I said, um, only those organisations who are core participants will receive um, advanced disclosure of, uh, of information ahead of public hearings um, and um, I'm sure the press will be seeking um, some form of core participant status. Um, but, but yeah, certainly some of the conversations that we've had is that there may um, run in parallel to uh, the COVID-19 inquiry uh, be an influx of um, FOI requests, uh, etc., which will put an unreasonable burden upon organisations. Now, I don't know what, what you're all doing as providers, whether whether you're, you're seeing um, and have been seeing them throughout COVID, but I know a, a number of organisations have done blanket responses since the very outset of, of COVID-19 saying that, um, you know, it's unreasonable and disproportionate to be able to provide uh, responses um, to, to these requests that are relevant to, to COVID-19 exclusively. Um, but of course, they're matters that you would need to take advice on before doing that. Um, I guess the other thing that's quite interesting, what is the right of control over any intervention the press might make? So, for example, does Baronet Hallett have an opportunity to say that should not be in the public domain at the moment? Or does she just have to live with the noises off that we all have to live with? Yeah, if, if, if the press obtain information in a legitimate means, um, then she's not going to be seeking to curtail the press in, in what is um, a public inquiry and should be very candid and open at all stages. Okay. 
Well, I think um, we don't have any more questions in the chat. And can I thank you, Liz and Philippa and Heather and everybody at Hempson's for putting on what I think has been a very, very informative uh, webinar. And I think from this, there will be lots of things that may come up as questions when people have had a, an opportunity to go away and think about this. So I would say do engage with Hempson's because it's right, really clear from this, um, this uh, webinar how much expertise there is within your organisation, uh, Liz, Philippa and Heather. And so I think as a sector, it would be good if people have particular issues or indeed want to take up um, some form of advice to get in touch with Hempson's to see whether or not they can provide that. Um, and in fact, so that's great. So we've got the contact details of both Philippa and Liz on screen at the moment. So I really want to thank everybody for their participation in the seminar. I want to thank Hempson's for putting this on because I think after this seminar, we're all much clearer about the processes involved in a public inquiry and also some of the areas where we might need to do some preparation as a sector. So I really appreciate that. And can I thank everyone for their attendance? Thank Hempson's for putting on the seminar and wish you all a very good morning. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>